Om Om Masato Ma Sat Gamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrittor Ma Amritang Gamaya Abir Abir Maiti Rudra Jatte Dakshinang Mukhang Tenamang Pahinityam Om Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from death to immortality Lead us from darkness to light Light us through and through And guide us evermore With thy loving presence Om Shanti 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 Peace Peace, peace. Our subject this morning, what is true mysticism? As I began to think of this subject, the thought of my master came to my mind. Because he was one of the greatest mystics of this age, the spiritual son of Ramakrishna. And I was thinking, how did he teach us about mysticism? What was his method? And I couldn't find out, couldn't remember, if he told us anything in so many words. He never gave any lecture. He never wrote any book. But we learn the truth of mysticism sitting at his feet and in silence. In silence he did communicate to, to us. He had the power, as you sit in his presence, he had the power to lift up your consciousness from this mundane world into another realm as it were. That is how we learned about mysticism. A few words to indicate or to show the way. That was all we learned from him. But we associated with him. We lived with him. There is a verse in the Gita. The recollected mind is awake in the knowledge of the Atman, which is dark night to the ignorant. The ignorant are awake in their sense life, which they think is daylight. To the seer it is darkness. It's a, another awakening. You see, we are, you are dreaming or you are asleep. Then you wake up. What has happened? Something different. Another consciousness. Similarly, you, this, this consciousness in the sense plane is like a prolonged sleep. And you wake up. Another realm, as it were, you don't go anywhere. Just as from sleep you wake up to this awakening, to this waking state, you don't go anywhere. Right there you have another consciousness. Similarly you wake up. And it is the consciousness of God. This prolonged dream goes away. And how can you express that in so many words? What is it? What is God? Nobody can express. You see, again, I am reminded of a pen picture drawn by the 8th century mystic philosopher Shankara. He draws this picture with his pen. The teacher is young, silent, seated in on meditation, 
under a tree. There is a disciple seated. The disciple was old. He was seated silently. Doubts, problems, worries. Besetting the mind of the disciple. And they are dispelled. There comes the tranquility in his heart. And he has the vision of the spirit. So there must be somebody, somebody to communicate that truth to us, not in words, but in silence. You see, for me, I have to talk to you about mysticism. I don't have that power to lift your consciousness so that you could, you'd forget completely this mundane world and you'd be in another realm and attain that peace that passeth understanding. That is mysticism. There is a verse in the Upanishads which I shall quote to you. To many it is not given to hear of the Atman. Many, though they hear of it, do not understand it. Wonderful is he who speaks of it, intelligent is he who learns of it. Literally, you see, I translated the word Ashcharya, wonderful. But I put it here, intelligent is he, because, you know, in English language they don't like one word to be repeated again. But wonderful also is the disciple. Is he who learns of it. Blessed is he who taught by a good teacher is able to understand it. So there must be both. The teacher must be wonderful, the disciple must be ready. Then only the communication is possible. But what about, what is mysticism? What, ab what is given or what do you get? What is the subject matter? Of course, you all know it is about God, about the true nature of ourself, about how to free ourselves from sufferings and miseries, how to become an heir to immortal bliss. That is what mysticism is. In other words, it is the experience of the truth, the ultimate truth, call that God or Absolute or Brahman or Atman or Divine Mother, whatever you may call it. And you see there are scriptures, there are the Gospels. Can't we learn from them? You know, Sri Ramakrishna used to say that in the Hindu almanac, there is written the forecast of how many inches of rain we shall have for the year. But you squeeze the almanac, not a drop comes. Furthermore, he said that everything in this world, scriptures also, have been defiled through the lips of men because they have been uttered through the lips of men. But there is one truth, the truth of God, that has never been uttered by the lips of man. You see, the supreme, the ultimate truth is indefinable, inexpressible. So it is only when you have the personal experience, then you have religion, then you know what mysticism is. You know, people interested in mysticism go to read books on mysticism. And there are hundreds and thousands of books written on mysticism. What do they get? They don't become mystics. And unless you are a mystic, you cannot understand anything. Yeah, it is interesting to read. 
Of course, there is the need of study. Only this much, that it must inspire you to practice, to live and practice and have that personal experience. That is the necessity. Now, as I said, this, this is not communicable in words. Because why? Because you cannot relate that experience to anything. You know, how does it taste, somebody asks you. You can say the, you can describe the taste of, say, ice cream by saying, now this is sweet, sugar, cream, and things like that. You can describe, you can relate it to something. But this experience you cannot relate because there is no relationship with any other experience. But then again, as you read books on mysticism, of course you, re you find out how the mystics experience this and that. They describe, yes. For instance, a mystic would describe, I saw a vision, I was transformed, and I saw a big light, ocean of light, waves of bliss, or I saw a, div a illumined cross, or a symbol, or a deity. You see, there are descriptions to be found, yes. But these are not the ultimate experiences of a mystic. These, as Swami Vivekananda pointed out, these are milestones on the way to progress. You see? Yes, you are progressing, but you have not yet reached the ultimate truth. You know, many, many mystics, real mystics, make a mistake, a pitfall. They have sudden illumination, a vision. Of course they have been practicing and, and suddenly a vision and illumination comes and they think they have attained the very highest. No. My master used to tell us, light, more light, more light. Is there any end to it? <coughs> but before explaining further, let me point out to you the difference between these spiritual visions which are describable in a way and still not understood until you have for yourself. <coughs> but anyway, what are the differences between these spiritual visions and experiences and hallucinations? or visions in a delirium. There is mainly this difference, that a man having hallucinations gradually becomes weak and weaker mentally. In other words, halluc hallucination comes to the diseased person weaker and weaker, and then ultimately lands in an asylum. And then how to, how to know that these visions are true and spiritual? He shall know by its fruits. What are the fruits of these visions? The man gets strength in character. He becomes purer. There comes a greater love, compassion in his heart. He has a greater control over his passions. These are the effects from these spiritual visions. But a question at this point may arise. Why do we have to have these visions and experiences? In fact, you find uh, there is a school of thought. Uh, that, that objects to, to, to become mystics. And in fact, you know, organized churches do not encourage mysticism. 
But of course, organized churches do not encourage mysticism because of the reason that a mystic cannot belong to any particular creed or a particular religion. You see, that is the difficulty. You do not remain a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Mohammedan. You become a man of God. And naturally, the organized religions do not encourage mysticism. Now, they can, then again, there are certain objections which every, almost every child will, will raise such objections. For instance, it's escapism. But just because we hear the word escapism, or somebody says, now look here, you are an escapist. As if that's a libel. <coughs> what is wrong being an escapist? Won't you escape if the house where you are living is on fire? Or the boat is sinking? Won't you escape? So why should you not try to escape from the sufferings and miseries and limitations of life? What is wrong with that? Now again, there is another charge which is very serious, and that is that mystics say that this life is evil. But that is a wrong understanding. The, no mystic will say this life is evil. The mystic will say, look here, there is something greater than this life in the plane of the senses. You see, would you call an egg evil? But suppose that egg remains as an egg and becomes rotten. Is there anything rottener than rotten egg? And man is Dija, twice born. You have to be born again. This is the shell that we are born in the plane of the senses from our mother's womb. Do not remain within, within that shell. You have to break through that shell of ignorance. And you have to be born anew. That new awakening, an inner awakening has to come. Then another objection is, is it opposed to rationalism? That is the question. Is it opposed to rationalism? You see, most people want reason and they are rather natural philosophers, naturalistic philosophers. <coughs> and so naturally they do not believe in mysticism because it is not rational in that sense of naturalism. Now what do I mean? You see, if our intellect is to establish its claim of truth by appealing to sense experience, then no, this mysticism is not within that realm of reason. But it is not opposed to reason. Then there is another two conditions for true mysticism must be fulfilled. One condition is that it would not oppose any other proof. In other words, though it is not within, that is, you can reach that with your reason or intellect, but it would not contradict your reason. Another factor is that this mystic experience must be of something or some truth that is otherwise unknowable. For instance, you know, you may think that mysticism is something like this. I can read your thoughts. Or I can tell you what you have in your pocket. Would that be mysticism? No. Because what you have in your pocket I can know, and anybody can know if he just puts his hand in your pocket, if you allow him to do that, of course. Or 
If I ask you, if you are frank enough, you will tell me what thoughts are going on in your mind. Or, for instance, I can read at a distance what is happening. Would that be mysticism? No. There are other ways to know such things. So they come within the psychic experiences. That's not spiritual or mystic. I shall come to that later. So it is something which is otherwise unknown and unable, and that is the truth of God only. Then the next question that arises, but why must we be mystics? You know, generally, you will say everybody saying that let us be good, pure, do good to one another, love our fellow men, live in love and harmony with all beings, find that peace within. That is religion. Yes, I do not contradict that truth. <clears throat> but in actual life, has it been possible without being mystics? Can we live in love and harmony with all beings unless we learn to see that divinity, that God, that oneness everywhere? Can we have that love and compassion unless we have love for God? You see, these effects we want in life. But what happens? It doesn't work. You see, you talk about brotherhood, for instance. As long as you believe the way I believe, as long as you agree with me, you are my brother. But when you do not agree with me, then I feel I have the right to liquidate you with atom bombs. So it doesn't work. How, how can it work? At least if a majority of people, you see the whole civilization, the whole, whole world, face of the whole world will change if there are a few mystics even. And that will spread. <laughs> it's individual. You have to have the growth individually. Mankind is a collective body, and individuals make up that collective body. That reminds me, you know, they talk about universal love. And, you know, every child will tell you, oh, I love all mankind. But that man cannot live with his brother for five days together. When it comes to loving the individuals, no. But they can love mankind. Universal love. You see, these are big talks. You know, when I was a little boy, I opened a book written by a Swami. And on the first page, there was written, wanted reformers, not of others, but of themselves. You know, that impressed me very much as a little boy. Wanted reformers. You see, we want to reform the world. Everybody wants to change the face of the world. But instead of that, if we can reform ourselves, each one, the world will stand reformed. And so it is mysticism. It is the devotion to God. It is the experience of God that can transform your life, that can establish in your life that peace, that love, that compassion that we all aspire for. You see, this experience of our world, with its joys and sorrows and multiplicity, is a direct and immediate experience in us. 
We directly experience it. And this experience is to be counteracted by another direct and immediate experience. So really, we see that oneness, feel that unity, feel that love and compassion only when we have reached, when we have realized that unity in God. It, it, and it has to be a direct and immediate experience, not because the scriptures tell us to live that way, not because the minister tells us to live that way, but because I have that experience. You see, man is the measure of every truth. And in each man, there is the possibility of experiencing different grades or levels of truth, beginning from matter to spirit and God. You see, man, we have this physical man, the mental man, and the spiritual man. Now it depends upon where your consciousness is. If you are a physical man, it's physical. If you are a mental man, it's intellectual. But fundamentally, you are a spiritual being. Until we come to that understanding, religion has no sense or meaning to the individual. You see, you can talk about God, or a Christ may walk your street, no, nothing happens. So you have to understand that man is fundamentally a, is a, is a spiritual being, his spirit. And he's encased in sheaths, we call. Physical sheath, then there's a subtle sheath, and there's a causal sheath. For instance, when we are awake, then we are in all these sheet, three sheets, physical, subtle, and causal. When we are dreaming, then the physical sheet, is, we are not conscious of, it, of that. There is a subtle and causal sheet. Then again, when we are deep, in deep sleep, we have left the Subtle sheet and the physical sheet, we live in causal sheet only. And nearer to the Atman or spirit or God. You see, you are spirit, you are one with God, covered with these sheets. Now again, just as there are these three sheets covering the Atman or the true <coughs> self, similarly in the cosmology, I mean in the cosmic, in the cosmos, there is the physical universe, there is a subtle universe, there is a causal universe, and there is Brahman, the Absolute. Brahman, the Absolute, as if covered by these sheaths. But not to him, this is not sheath of ignorance. Now, you see, there is a unity between the physical universe and our physical being. Modern science proves that there is no difference between your, and your body and my body. It is one ocean of matter, one ocean of existence. Cells from my body are going to, to, your, to the cells of your body and so on and so forth. There is one, one vast ocean of existence. And it is therefore possible for us to know one another, to experience the objects of the universe with our senses. There is taste, sound, touch, smell, vision, you see. We experience with our senses this physical universe. Then there is a psychic universe. In the psychic universe, you see, these elements or these sense experiences that we have, touch, taste, smell, and so forth. There is the same thing in a subtler form, in a causal form, in the psychic plane, in the psychic universe. Now, 
You see, you may, through some means or other, can get into that psychic plane. And then you will see a light that you don't see outside. You will hear something. You will smell fragrance. And there is touch also. You see, all these in subtler form. And of course, intenser and greater. But that's the psychic plane, not mysticism. Remember that. Now in this connection, let me quote to you the yoga aphorism of Patanjali was a great psychologist of India. He pointed out these psychic powers, you see clairvoyance, clear audience, these psychic visions, these psychic powers may be obtained either by birth. You see, some people are born with psychic powers. They had developed in their past birth, and so when they are born, they are born with that psychic power or by means of drugs, see masculine, or in Mexico what something is there, you know, I forget the word, mushroom, you know, sometimes I forget these English words. And in India we have what is known as hemp, not smoking, but hemp, they make a paste and make a drink out of that hemp and they drink that, and they, they get some psychic powers. Begin to see light, you see the walls will be there, but those pictures will be there, they will light up. And then you can read the thoughts of people, you know, you begin to see the character of an individual. It's a dangerous thing, you know. Or, by the power of words, there are certain mantras to develop those powers or by concentration. Now, you see, remember that through drugs, for instance, see, there is too much talk about this masculine and, and this mushrooms, you know, and they consider them to be spiritual visions and compared to even the vision of the absolute Brahman and so on and so forth. But these are psychic visions. And psychic powers do come through the drugs. But here is the point. You see, if you earn it, you become psychic, and you can remain in that psychic plane. <coughs> but these drugs give you that power for the moment. As soon as the effect of the drug is gone, you are left flat. <coughs> so do not ever use drugs considering, oh, it would give you wonderful visions. No. Then there comes a reaction in your life. You become dry spiritually. Now again, spiritual visions are something different. See, as I already said, that by the effect you know. What are those effects? There comes devotion to God, greater devotion. There comes sweetness in life. There is a greater love and devotion, and gradually there goes away from you any lustful thought even, you see. And no greed anymore. Those are the effects. And it is in the causal plane, you see, it's spiritual, spiritual uh, people, that is what we have heard, from our teachers, to avoid the psychic plane. It's not good. It's a temptation. And you read in the Yoga aphorisms of Patanjali, he describes all the psychic phenomena and all the powers and how those powers can be achieved. He gives all the, all the details about how to even achieve those powers and how many kinds of powers are there. But then he points out these are powers to the worldly-minded person, but these are obstacles to the spiritual man. And the greatest power, he points out, is to forget these powers. You know, in India, I'll tell you my own experience at one time. I was a little boy, 
And just next house there came a so-called holy man. And we all went to see him. And you see, he had, he had some particular power which I am going to tell you. You just touch his toe, and as you touch his toe, you just think of some smell or fragrance or any kind of odor, good or bad. Rose, jasmine, or a bad odor, you know. You think and touch his feet, then you smell your fingers, you get that same odor. Oh, I got very excited, you know. I wanted to follow him as his disciple. And then there was an older man seated there and he was watching me. He said, come here. You like that? Yes, isn't that wonderful? And he said, have you heard the name of Vivekananda? Yes. Then he said, you come to me, I'll show you what he says. And then when I went there, he showed me Raja Yoga. And there, what Vivekananda pointed out, what just now I told you, that these powers are powers in the worldly sense, but they are obstacles. And then it has been pointed out how anybody using those powers, you see, suppose you are not wanting those powers, you are a spiritual person, and you are devoted to God, and you want Him, to you also, suddenly, a power can come to you without your seeking. But then, you see, our teaching is test it, use it once to see the validity of it. Then forget it. Then as you don't use that power, you lose that power. And a spiritual man that is one spiritual life he wants to lose such powers when they come to him. <coughs> now again I must point out that amongst mystics there are two pitfalls. One is that as we become mystics or want to become mystics and are spiritual aspirants, we are meditating, we are chanting the name of the Lord, we are trying to live the pure life, life of control and all that, and we are working and meditating for years and years. No vision comes. So we think our attempt is a failure. This is a pitfall. The growth it doesn't mean because you may have visions that you have better, greater growth than the other person who has no vision, if you think. That's a mistake. These visions come to certain temperaments, not to all temperaments. Mysticism, as I already pointed out, is not merely visions. Are, these visions are milestones on the way to progress. But the progress, real progress, is character, purity, dispassion, discrimination, devotion to God. If you have these, then is it that you are growing? That's the sign of growth, spiritual growth. You know, at one time, many disciples of Sri Ramakrishna were having visions and experiences. And then there was one who became known as one of the greatest of his disciples, Swami Premananda. He came to him and said, But Holy Sir, I don't have visions. These people have visions and experiences but I don't have any. Do something for me that I may have visions. And Sri Ramakrishna said, do you think visions are great things? Look at Vivek Narin, Narin Vivekananda. He doesn't have visions, but look at his character, his purity, his dispassion, his discrimination, his renunciation. Look at that. That is the real thing. But there is 
the highest experience, not exactly the highest, next to highest, what we call, is samadhi. That's the experience of the causal bliss. Beyond physical and psychic, you are in the causal plane. You see, perhaps I can make it more clear or more understandable if I point out to you another factor about mysticism, that there are spiritual centers of consciousness in this human body. And as our mind dwells within the three lower centers, you see there is at the root of the spine, base of the spine, then at the base of the genitals, then at the navel, three, then the heart center, then there is the center in the throat, then center here, then center there. These are the seven centers of spiritual consciousness. When the mind dwells in the three lower planes, you have the sense experience, and mind dwells in lust and greed. But as it comes to the center in the navel plane, you become psychic. You become spiritual and have devotion to God and have vision of light and even of your chosen ideal when it comes to the heart. Then when it comes to the center of throat, your mind becomes purer. And you can't think of anything else but of God. You can't talk of anything else but of God. Then when it comes between the eyebrows, you have the sabhikalpa or the lower samadhi. There, that is the real thing. Without these visions, you see, you can come there and attain samadhi. This samadhi, this lower samadhi also, is not exactly describable. But only difference between this and that consciousness is that there is a sense of, of separation. I am experiencing this sense is there. When it comes there, the experience, the experiencer and the experienced have become one. Unified consciousness. You see, the ideal of spiritual life is to attain that. Now, what does it mean? You see, it's a state of attainment. Visions come and go. But you have to reach, true mysticism is to reach a state of attainment. It's just like this. One of my disciples just pointed out this way. That there is a beast and there is man. Another level. And there is a God-man. You see? So you are man now. You see, beast, a dog, has, if the dog aspires to be a man, he has to give up that body and become a man. But the man, if he aspires to be a God-man, he doesn't have to give up the body. But he has to be born anew. And Sri Ramakrishna described that that is the union between Atman and Brahman. Conjugal union even, he said. And there is no, nothing but ananda, bliss, bliss, blissful consciousness. Another Swami told, said at one time, a disciple of Ramakrishna, that I've had visions, but I, I don't care for visions. But now I feel that the Atman is separate from everything. I have that attainment. But Atman is something separate from everything else. See, that is the state of attainment, having attained which there is nothing else to be gained. There is the fullness of life. But of course, as I said, that there is no way to have this attainment without being a spiritual aspirant. Ultimately, this attainment or visions, experiences come through divine grace. 
man by himself cannot reach. It is the grace. Now again, does it mean that this grace is conditional or God has grace upon some few chosen ones or something like that? No. That grace is upon everybody. But we have to learn to feel that grace. You see, there is this saying of Sri Ramakrishna, there is the breeze blowing, breeze of grace blowing. But in order to catch that breeze, you have to set your sail. So this setting our sail means to become a spiritual aspirant, desire for that grace. And practice the disciplines, control of passions, devotion to God. You see, these are the main ways to become spiritual aspirants. And then that grace is felt and through His grace, through that divine grace, of course it is the grace of this God within, that attainment is possible. Om Hari Om Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrittor Ma Amritam Gamaya Abir Abir Maiti Rudra Jatte Dakshinam Mukham Tenamang Pahinityam Om Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from death to immortality. Lead us from darkness to light. Light us through and through and guide us evermore with thy loving presence. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.